Good evening, everyone. My name is Caroline Bowman. I'm the director. Wow, I asked for a light. I got it. <laughs> I'm the director of Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, and I am absolutely thrilled to welcome you tonight to our second in the Design Talk series. And I'm especially joyous because the curators and I just had a wonderful meeting with Jeannie Gang, and she is very generously giving us many drawings and a model for the permanent collection of Cooper Hewitt. So thank you, Jeannie. Um, very excited to welcome you as the newest designer in our permanent collection. So it's a wonderful way to start our evening. Cooper Hewitt's purpose is to inspire, educate, and empower people through design. We do this through exhibitions, education programs, our National Design Awards, and online content and discussion. This series, Design Talks, is generously supported by the Ad Adobe Foundation, and it's meant to promote dialogue about current issues in design, and it's a chance for us to highlight great practitioners working in design today. This year, we are featuring the winners of the 2013 National Design Awards. Later this month, we will discuss public space in today's cities with the legendary Michael Sorkin and James Wines. In April, we will have landscape architect Margie Rudick and Jeanette Sadi Khan talking about the repurposing of the urban landscape. And in May, we will speak about interior architecture with Aidlin Darling Design. Check our website for more information. And on that note, we're having a few technical difficulties, but we should be um, having this webcast live tonight, and it'll be available on our web website as well after tonight's event. As many of you know, uh, you made it, good. As many of you know, Cooper Hewitt is undergoing a massive renovation, and it is the reason why we are here rather than at our main campus at 2 East 91st Street. And we're not only expanding our space by 60%, but we're improving all of our facilities, and we can't wait to welcome you back, which will probably be in late fall of 2014. But the main thing to get excited about is we're really taking this opportunity, which in the end will be three years, to completely reinvent what Cooper Hewitt is about and what the museum experience is, is about. And I'm keeping that mysterious because there are obviously some um, surprises that we'll be announcing as we get closer to the opening. But again, um, fasten your seatbelts because it'll be a wonderful ride once we reopen the museum. We're collaborating if you can believe it, with eight different design teams, Diller Scafidio and Renfro and Think Design on the reinstallation of our exhibitions and local projects as our media team. And it, it will be quite incredible changing you, our visitor, from, a from a, an observer to a participant, really learning about design and becoming a designer yourself. Tonight, we are delighted to welcome National Design Award winning architect and MacArthur Fellow, Jeannie Gang. Jeannie is the founder of Studio Gang Architects, a Chicago-based collective of architects, designers, and think thinkers practicing internationally. Gang uses architecture as a medium of active response to contemporary issues and their impact on human experience. Each project resonates with its specific site and culture while addressing larger global themes such as urbanization, climate, and sustainability. The firm's projects range from tall buildings like the Aqua Tower to the Nature Boardwalk at Lincoln Park Zoo. Studio Gang's work has been exhibited at the Venice Biennale and museums across the nation. A little bit about the format tonight. Jeannie will first talk about her work and its inspiration, and then we'll be joined by David Vandelier of the Van Allen Institute. Before I welcome Jeannie to the stage, I'd like to show a short clip that we actually shared with our guests at the National Design Awards this year. I like seeing design in both big and small things, you know, from a you know, a bridge and how it's created to small details in, in a building. And I think that's a great thing about architecture. It could span over those breadths between giant, enormous city plans to, to real touchable physical material. It's not an act of just my own personal will that I'm putting on a building. It has to work for people and how they use it. And that's really how the building gets shaped. It's, you know, 
really asking yourself those questions. How is this going to liberate the users to be able to use this building in new ways? How is it going to help the way that they work or see the world? And then, you know, you have to really understand that before jumping into the form making. Please join me in welcoming Jeannie to the stage. Oh, Caroline, you're so tall. <laughs> That's OK. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me tonight. I'm really pleased to be able to talk about my work directly with you and to really talk a little bit more about the process that uh, we go through for design and hopefully um, have maybe some, I just created a few suggestions at the end of ways to uh, use creativity toward solving problems and toward, um, toward making an impact with design. And so the research, how it informs the work, and also at the end we'll be able to have a conversation um, that, that um, finds some similar topics with David Vanderleer as well. Um, so I'm wondering if we can have the lights down maybe just a little bit. Um, design is a process for us that really um, comes out of the things that we are interested in and the curiosities that um, arise within us. And sometimes projects maybe don't even have a client. Um, and those projects, those research projects, tend to be the ones that end up informing our, our projects for clients. Um, one, one project, research project, that we completed um, recently was this book called Reverse Effect. And, and it, was, it was a book really to communicate with the public about um, some important issues about the Chicago River um, and, and issues of flooding, invasive species, and some opportunities with a post-industrial edge around this river. And, and we timed this book being released to correspond to some policy uh, work that was going on. Uh, um, so we collaborated on this project with the Natural Resources Defense Council, who was interested in, uh, in addressing river issues in Chicago. Um, so I'm going to start the talk kind of up at the Great Lakes and then end it more down toward the Gulf of Mexico. But um, the reverse effect really in, in, uh, was influenced by both, because um, the Chicago City of Chicago about 100 years ago reversed the flow of the Chicago River um, in order to save drinking water. Um, and in doing so, they kind of flushed the pollution downstream, ending up in, you know, in the Gulf. Um, in the meantime, uh, many of these invasive species of fish were f uh, starting to move up the Mississippi River and, and threatening to move into the Great Lakes. So this is an image of the, the canals that were designed huge, massive public projects um, about 100 years ago that were really connecting uh, these water flows across uh, the subcontinental divide. So essentially taking lake water, which is gulf, uh, which is uh, glacial melt, and really connecting it to the Mississippi River and down to the Gulf. So 26 miles of canals were made. Um, and, and you know, as time went on, uh, the issues started to be become apparent. One, the one of them is the, the invasive species of carp that are making their way up to the Great Lakes and could have a really big impact on the uh, fishing uh, businesses, on recreation. They tend to like to jump out of the water when you go by with your boat. So it, it makes uh, the recreational aspect of, of boating kind of treacherous, uh, really scary. Actually, you could see the fish up in the corner in that one. Um, there are about you know 90 pound fish that, that jump out, but there were also many other problems as well with the river, including um, industrial waste and sewage being flushed into this river. And so our project, the book I was showing you, was really about designing a series of steps that could be taken to improve the quality. And so in realizing that this couldn't be done all at once in one fell swoop, um, how could you imagine taking a series of steps that would would have a positive impact. And um, if you look at step number one, which is really the second image up there, uh, one of the things about step number one is to was to really encourage the city to acquire property along the river where the industry was moving out 
and also to increase the public's access to the river edge. So um, part of the problem of, the, of river pollution is just that no one had access to it, and they don't have access to it, and they don't want access to it maybe because it's dirty. And so um, the real idea is to increase that access um, and then when people have that as a natural resource, they will suddenly start to care about it. And we actually found people that were using it and caring about it. Um, so the idea would be to disconnect that, those canals, and to in eventually, in the long run, start to reclaim and recycle all the wastewater and, and put it back into the lakes. The lakes are actually all glacial melt, so you know once that water is gone, it's a kind of a closed system and it won't be replaced. So this would be a future um, idea. So I think one of the qualities architects can bring to public projects is really taking the science and trying to sort through that and making it visible for people to understand what solutions could be. So we, we kind of imagined this is, this is what the city looks like now with um, the, a lot of this industry kind of evacuating along the edge and what it could look like in the future once these freshwater lagoons are installed. And so this was, like I said, a piece that was supposed to help people understand the issues of the river, especially in timed with some very important policy that was coming out. So I feel like part of the role of the architect is to, um, to communicate these ideas to the greater public. Um, what came about, though, and how that shapes into an actual project was that um, this first step was actually starting to happen, and, and the mayor of, of Chicago, Rahm Emanuel, decided to um, make a series of public access points along the rivers and, and install, for in this case, um, two boat, house, boat houses, one on the north side and one on the south side of Chicago. Um, and there were two others as well that were, th these are rowing facilities for clubs that would also have programs for the public. So what we did there was start to um, embark on a design project that would implement some of our ideas about the river and bring them bring that public access forward. Um, we had very short, limited time to design the, this project. This is the first one of the Chicago boat houses, um, and it was located on a, a park site uh, where the club was actually rowing out of already. Uh, this is a, a physical model of the site. So the, the, the rowers that brave the Chicago River today are, are um, a couple of teams that are cross-city teams with lots of different um, participants from different high schools. Um, and they go out there in all weather and try to, to row on this river. Um, for our design process, because it was so condensed, we, we kind of relied on something that we already knew about, which was these Moybridge images of rowing and looking at the motion of the rowing, um, studying also how the oar actually moves through the water. So you can see we're kind of switching gears from this bigger picture of river health to really getting into a design issue um, and, and thinking about this uh, motion and try to, trying to translate that into something that could be a building. Uh, this was a physical model we made of the oars moving through the water times every second through one sweep, and then translating that into the architecture we moved into, thinking about it really as a roof form. Uh, you can see in the lower part of this image uh, the, the position of the hands, and it, it started to suggest kind of two types of trusses um, with, with a sweep in between them. Um, a boathouse is such a nice program because there really isn't much um, pressure on that building to have a lot of mechanical systems or a lot of different things. It really is just to store boats um, and to work on boats. Um, we, this is an early model of a, of a mock-up trying to understand the difference between the two trusses and how that might create facets in the facade. And then finally, this is, well, it was just opened um, this fall. Um, the interior, really very simple materials. You can, this is the structure for the boats, uh, which is um, dimension to align with the with the size of the boats, so that really set up the rhythm of the space, um, and you can see the different shape trusses. So it's really just a steel building with with um, plywood cladding um, that helps that curve be observed in the space. And then in use, 
uh, the teams are now using this, rowing out of the um, rowing out of this building, and also using the the full the year round um, field house for for working out and practicing. Um, this is a view of the big apron going down to the river, and you can see the two different truss shapes there. And then inside the field house, which is a two structures, there's a tank, which can be used for practice in the winter, like now. <laughs> and um, um, various, they also do programming, so that the teams uh, actually teach people how to row, so you can go learn that there. And they have programs for um, uh, disabled people and, and uh, youth throughout the city. So it's really kind of an infrastructural project in that sense, too, because it's investing in the waterfront, but also in the youth of the city. This is one of the programs that they have for um, disabled veterans learning to row, because the rowing really creates this kind of teamwork and, and a, a, a feeling of, um, of progress and success. Um, this is one of the, the community space in the field house where um, um, many events can happen for the community besides just rowing, so they can have um, community meetings and um, 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 people can rent it out for events and things like that. And this is finally the, the erg room, it's called, at the top of the structure in, in the two-story building that has, again, these two different shapes of trusses. These are Virendil trusses. Uh, with the warping surface in between, kind of mimicking the mo fluidity of the rowing. Um, outside on the second floor, there's a big porch where um, the parents and people can watch rowers coming back into to the city. Um, and then finally, this is just a view. This is the outdoor bay that houses the coaches' boats. Um, and then here you can see the location of the building on the Chicago River with the city off to the right. Um, another project that kind of gets on the research, uh, is inspired by the research, and, and we've taken the research further, is this project for Linga Park Zoo. It was a, a 19th century park version of nature in the city, um, and they wanted to, they wanted us to kind of rethink this pond in relation to um, these, the surroundings and make it more of a vibrant habitat. So the, the this park was located right within a zoo, um, but we wanted to create here something more of a zoo without cages um, and, and really make the habitat so interesting that, that it would attract uh, different species of animals and, and start to um, reinforce the um, biodiversity of, of this park within the city. Uh, this is a finished image of it. There's a boardwalk that wraps it. Basically, we ripped out the edges of the pond and, and figured out how to um, use rainwater runoff and, and clean it with plants in order to replenish the pond, so basically taking it off of the um, city infrastructure. And, and as well, this is interesting because it's, it's acting as stormwater reservoir, so it's doing multiple functions. So I think what I really like about this project is it has an architectural component, which is this very simple pavilion made with bent wood elements. Um, and at the same time, it so it creates almost like a public space, and an open air pavilion that's supposed to be used for teaching classes, but it's used for many different things. Um, and it also creates a, a functioning ecosystem right within the city. Um, this is. And, and it's become used by many different types of people for anything from yoga classes to the teaching, and everybody wants to, especially architects, get married under this um, um, arch uh, with city views. Um, and lately, it's really attracted um, a lot of wildlife as well. So there were about 40 nesting pair of black-crowned night heron that has increased to 400 pair since the park has opened. There's lots of different um, species that are coming there, especially even coyotes, which are like attracted to the pond at night. This is a nighttime camera that they installed. And so you can, the, this people in the city can actually, um, there's blog with all kinds of posted images from people all over uh, the city of Chicago that really are coming in very close contact with a kind of version of nature that's much more wild. 
Um, and lately, it's also been used for a dance company that we're collaborating with on another project. So it's it's kind of really got the, the architectural, the, the urban, the urbane, and, and the wildlife all coming together in one project. Um, just to mention some, the, the research as it pertains to towers is oftentimes more of a for, uh, kind of like formal research and research because towers are so particular in their structure and the way that they are um, developed. But for, for our personal, our, our own office, as we've developed on, almost like a, a morphology of tower types, all coming from the first two ideas that, um, we, that were initiated from the Aqua Tower. So I think we've done now um, probably about 16 projects you know, in various states of being finished. Um, but, but a lot of these ideas really came from that initial project, the Aqua Tower. And so it's interesting with towers how it's, it's, more, of a, it's more of a research that has to do with um, the typology and the use as opposed to um, some of the ecology ideas I talked about earlier. So, so Aqua was really about this external use of the building, creating balconies that people could use and to see each other and to make taking advantage of how tall the building is to create variation over the height of it. Um, so very small changes from floor to floor, the slabs changing very little, um, can create this amazing effect You know, when multiplied um, by the whole height. So it, it kind of argues against the idea of, um, of the tall building just being a, a, an icon, a cartoon outline sketch of a shape and it, it's an argument for starting with an incremental small piece and seeing how that can be multiplied. It also you know, has this benefit, the benefit of having a social space on the exterior of the building where neighbors can interact, um, not necessarily in the elevator. Um, so so one, one thing that came from this, and just a, a quick shot of a project we're working on right now that's in construction, it was, it was really, there was this issue of the balcony being a social space that we've taken um, a little bit further in, in the next project, um, which is for this city Hyde Park. Uh, it's a mixed use residential building in, in Hyde Park where the University of Chicago is located. And it has a northern exposure and a southern exposure and the balconies are really on the, on the southern exposure. On the <laughs> north there are operable uh, bay windows. Um, so, so one of the issues with, with um, Aqua that we wanted to improve upon was that there is a continuous slab going from inside to outside, so there's some thermal bridging there. So th in this case, we've, we've con created a balcony spiral, which is an independent, almost like a column that's, that's independent of the interior structure, and it just ties back to the interior structure. So it's, it's a column, almost like a stack of cards um, we worked with several ideas in the model um, to create this this structure that would be freestanding. So the way that it works is it's just a, a series of, of um, wall-like columns and slabs that are stacked up like a stack of cards. And then they tie back into the building, but they are independent of it. And then the way that that is looking in three dimensions is really giving, again, it's giving this very lively facade to the building, all done with just a simple idea of the incremental balcony. Um, and then I wanted to show you two more projects really quickly. The um, Kalamazoo College Arcus Center for Social Justice Leadership, which is a project that is currently un under construction. And it, it, tie, it a little bit ties together kind of the research about social issues, um, environment, but also um, there's a certain organic quality to it coming from its, the material research. Um, this is Kalamazoo College. It's a small college in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And it, it's, um, they've, they're, oops, they've had a very uh, strong program in social justice um, where students go out into the world and, and um, con uh, conceive of projects within social justice and then they actually implement their projects. And um, this would be a center where the students can 
come to hear lectures, where there will be faculty and seminars and meetings, um, and really a hub for social justice that also ties to the activities going on within Kalamazoo, the city itself. So there's kind of a connection between the college and the city. Um, one of the problems of intervening in this campus, you know, from a social justice perspective was just that all of the architecture was kind of a neo-colonial style, and um, um, it just didn't really seem to lend itself to um, this new mission that was taking place there. In our building, I don't know if I could point to this, but in the, uh, in the far left corner of the campus was our building site and um, adjacent to a grove. Um, so in order to understand the space of social justice, we really started to look at cities, different places, things that were happening in cities, um, and, and we're very interested in the way that um, the freedom of a city allows almost a self-organizing um, order. This is a view that was actually published at, on um, CNN's website during the Arab Spring, and you would like you could go and see how people organize this City, the city without walls, which was fascinating um, to understand um, and, and very kind of inspiring as an as a idea. Um, we also looked for precedents that were not, you know, architects wouldn't normally look at maybe some older things like the um, Native American long houses that were used for meetings, um, but also traditional buildings in Mali that were for elders with this uh, up in the upper left, this really interesting structure where um, the elders could have heated discussions, but no one could really raise their temper too much because the ceiling is so low, you couldn't stand up. <laughs> it forces you to, to have a civilized conversation. And um, also step wells and other places, we were looking at a lot of these as precedents. Um, the final form for this particular project came to be this kind of three, like a trifoil shaped uh, structure that had three big apertures facing different orientations, um, one being the neighborhood nearby, the um, the campus architecture, and then the uh, grove. And in the center is is just a convening space, many different ways and different um, different ways that people could see each other, meet, and have a conversation. We also learned that like the preparation of food really breaks down boundaries as well, so there's this kind of open kitchen as well in there. And then the idea of, of the arcs being the different scales of, of what the Arcus Center would, um, would work on in, in, their, um, in their work. Um, so this kind of developed into these thickened walls along the arc, so the darker program located within the thickened walls. Um, this is the plan as, as it developed. Um, and one really interesting discovery along uh, at, during design, I guess, was was the um, figuring out how the material materiality of this project would be implemented. Um, we wanted to do something pretty sustainable and and local, um, and discovered that there was a wood that could be used, a white cedar that had the range very close by in Michigan. Um, and we also discovered that these cedar forests were, were originally used uh, for buildings such as this. This is like a 100-year-old barn that we found that was uh, made with this wood masonry technique, um, looking at it up close. So the, instead of using brick, they actually used logs um, with mortar in between. And what was so fascinating about this was just that you know, as a log, you're actually Im holding the carbon, you're embodying the carbon. Uh, whereas if you use brick, you were really, you know, burning the bricks and producing carbon into the atmosphere. So if you could somehow get this technique updated to today, it would be a really great way to do the center. So really, the project became a lot about reviving this lost technique. We found just several individual practitioners um, that were still kind of building a few saunas and things like that with it, uh, and brought and we we found this guy who we just talked into coming to um, Kalamazoo and teaching us and our contractors how to do this. Um, I really like the tech, the idea that the 
each tree is different. The, the rings are different, and it's all like a reflection of the environment and the amount of water that was there and the growth. Just like a human being's face is different. Um, and so that was kind of an interesting tie to this project. Uh, this is one of our workshops where we were learning how to do the um, wood masonry on a little sample. These are um, architects from our office up um, in a summer camp <laughs> doing a wood masonry. Um, and then we kind of started to play with that. And, and what was interesting is um, we realized we could do a lot of different warping surfaces with this technique because it's such a small element. So this is a model showing um, one of the windows that we developed in the wall. This is still physical models. This is a project that's um, under construction right now. Um, it's um, going to be finished in the fall, and we're really excited. I have like maybe one, but there's a construction photo um, looking at the building from above. It, it happened to be one of the coldest winters ever, but they were able to. <laughs> they're they're working on this um, as we speak to uh, finish it out. And then the last thing is just going tying back to the research and how it kind of has impacted our the way that we work I guess has has um, led to us working on certain types of projects um, and so from um, thinking about water in the lake we're now kind of moving on to water in the ocean I guess um, and the National Aquarium has asked us to help them think about um, these four issues that they are dealing with so this is really a more of using research to help an organization with their strategic goals and you know not necessarily all about architecture it's really about you know how they can move their organization forward and they had these four kind of burning questions um, one of them was they they currently have eight eight dolphins in their collection and um, as public opinion and as science moves forward we uh, we all know that um, cetaceans are highly intelligent maybe some of you have seen blackfish or or the cove um, and so as as this new CEO entered the National Aquarium he really wanted to stop having these animals in captivity as and one of the first things he did was stop having dolphin shows you know and um, and so one of the the issues is like how, what do you do ethically with, this, with the dolphins um, if you are no longer going to keep them in captivity? So we were helping them explore, um, and we're doing this now, like you know, the issue of, of dolphins in captivity. And a lot of the research has been trying to understand the, all the issues, it's very complex. Um, in India, recently, they declared dolphins a non-human persons, which is a category and have banned all dolphin shows. So you, there's, there's a kind of a tipping point coming and um, trying to understand that. So this is really just these last slides are showing you like just pulled off of the boards, <laughs> you know, not really conclusive in any, any way yet, but showing the process of using drawing and design to understand problems. Um, and so, and currently I'm teaching a studio down at Rice where <sighs> the students are also helping sort this out. Um, Dolphin tank standards have changed, and that has actually made it more expensive to keep dolphins. So places like the UK, UK have stopped um, 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 building these facilities and, and are trying to figure out what to do as well. These are public aquaria and the ones that, are, um, that have marine mammals in them. So it's kind of something that's increasing in number, but the problem is getting bigger because then what do you do with all these animals? Um, another part of that was to figure out, help them figure out what to do with the Baltimore facility and make it more connected, especially given that um, on the right in Pier 4 they actually have a dolphin uh, a show, a show place, an auditorium, and what becomes of that. Um, they have a facility in Washington, D.C. Uh, that is like in the basement of the Commerce Department that was being closed for renovation, so to help them kind of reconceive um, what would be going into the DC facility. So with a lot of times we'll start in history, like looking at what what is the ocean, what you know, we've all heard of Pangea, but there's also Pantalassa, which was describing in um, according to Greeks, um, the whole one ocean. Um, and you can see this drawing of a Greek concept of ocean where it's just one thing. So all these waters are actually, you know, so connected in their imagination. 
Um, and then there's a political side to the ocean in terms of uh, what territory belongs to whom and and what is protected. So it's, uh, you know, once you start getting into it, it's very interesting. It's only 2% of the world's oceans are protected, uh, but there's a lot of um, <coughs> battles going on of, over the resources. Um, and then, uh, you know, the way that you measure what ocean belongs to which country is a perimeter around a landmass. So even a little island, you know, gets a perimeter. So it's interesting to think that the United States is, well, it's the largest um, ocean holdings, but some place like New Zealand, which is so small, is number six. Um, so these, right now, studying these economic zones and trying to understand more about this and, and thinking about the world, if you actually, if you look at Google Earth from this one point of view, you can, it's almost no land visible. So we have so much water, but um, we spend very little time exploring it. Um, whereas, like NASA's bu budget is 3.8 billion, billion, and NOAA has something like only like a 23.7 million dollar budget. Um, and then we have explored Mars and the Moon, 100% um, high resolution mapping, and only 5% of the ocean has been mapped. And so there's this incredible place right out there <laughs> that is um, that is so unexplored. Um, so also, the, the right now we're thinking about the imagination and the the, um, the idea of in the early, you know, in the 20th century, both the space and the ocean were almost like the same mysterious thing, um, and that's changed so much. And today, you know, it's really the ocean is really the, the more mysterious place. So these are just like some summary thoughts about our process. It's really about. Um, trying to think critically and to trying to reframe what the question is. So even though if, if the National Aquarium is asking us to think about their, <laughs> their building, it really, sometimes you have to step back and think bigger about what the questions really are. Um, I think having the diverse office is really an important thing too because you have all these different people with different backgrounds and that adds to the richness of the solutions that you can come up with. Um, and then the space for just you know, group activity, um, accepting failures, and, and and making it okay to be um, to have that space for making um, lots of ideas uh, realities. And then um, this one is just calling it fluency because I think it's really important to learn the language of the the the, the people you're working with. And so if they're talking about marine biology, you kind of just have to get up to speed it to a certain degree on that. Um, and then understanding who all the users are. These are all users that we interviewed about the Chicago River project. So from rowers to fishermen to, you know, to, to someone who gives tours along the river, um, all using it in different ways. And then testing. This is something lately we've been using um, big data a lot with a um, over the last maybe four or five years to test solutions um, before they're implemented. And then also um, just having this luxury to allow yourself to drift and, and to, to try to f make the problem something that you are interested in as well. So with that, I'll close and uh, we can have a conversation. <laughs>
I'd love to start with the Aqua Tower. Um, I'm not sure that you're all aware that the Aqua T Tower is actually the tallest skyscraper built and de designed and built by a woman, and I would like to open with that <laughs> because, um, <laughs> bravo. So the Aqua Tower and City Hyde Park mm -hmm. are both emphasizing community. Mm -hmm. And other than the balconies, mm -hmm. how else were you trying to encourage mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. And now, how are you seeing yeah. people joining together and being social? Yeah, um, it's, it's so interesting because when we began the project, there was a lot of rules in place. Um, sometimes developers have where you have to have separate entries for different people who are using the building and things like that. And for Aqua, we we realized that if we combined the amenities, we would have much better, you know, just killer amenities, like big swimming pools and basketball courts and all kinds of things. Um, but it, it depended on making those shared. So I think it really, it broke some new ground in that particular market anyway, of, of sharing amenities, um, which became a very social place for the different um, owners. Because the building actually has a hotel uh, rental apartments and the condomi condominium <coughs> units in it. So kind of very three different types of people that would be using the building. Um, but it's really worked out pretty well. Actually, like a lot of people are getting together on this building. They're like, you know, meeting each other. And um, I, th I was impressed by that and that only seeing that after the building's been up for a number of years and, and watching how it's worked out, it became a very social extrovert building. <laughs> Last time I was in Chicago, I actually made a, a pilgrimage for the uh, building and I could see it, but little did I know that it was about four miles away. So it was a, <laughs> it was a very nice walk. Yeah. And once I got there, I was really impressed with the social feeling and the mm. ambiance within the building. Mm. So you've really yeah. succeeded in making it a very social, social place. Okay. I wonder in Chicago, um, where all of these iconic architectural stars have lived and created. What was the response of mm. the Chicago community when you first proposed the, the building? Mm. Well, it, it was interesting that, the, luckily, timing-wise, it just made it under the wire before the economic downturn. Mm. Um, and so, really, when we were proposing the building, it almost went un, unseen because there were so many buildings being proposed. And it just kind of came in under the radar and um, one, one of the main things that we tried to do was get the city to allow us to do a taller building, a mm. taller, skinnier building with the same area. Um, and they agreed, you know, after we presented it, um, that it was a much taller building than what was in the first plan. So anyway, it was, it was, um, no one really knew about it until it was there. It was, wow. <laughs> yeah. Lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> How, how is it to build s so much in your own city? I think it's one of the amazing things that you're able to build so much. And I, know, I don't think any architect who, yeah, in their own hometown can do so much. I, I'm really glad yeah. about that because it's nice to have, pro uh, it's been great for our, we're very collaborative and mm -hmm. our, our staff is really getting to experience construction, you know, in, in real time and you know when you're working on projects that are all over the world sometimes you know it gets handed off and things like that so right. i think it's built up uh, a really strong base of knowledge there but how I, I don't know i mean i think it was really because we're doing we're doing a lot of different types of projects things from small community centers mm -hmm. to tall buildings and the tall buildings don't come around that that often i mean it takes uh, years and the economy mm -hmm. has to be right, but the things that we're doing for community are ongoing and and they're just mm -hmm. they're not big budgets or anything, but they are equally important as I think as infrastructure elements in a, in a city. Is it very important that you're in many of the meetings because I can I can imagine it like okay yeah she's coming and great we. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, instead know, of like constantly being on the road. Yeah, no, I yeah. I am constantly on the road, but um, you know it's it's like a pleasure. It's a, it's a guilty pleasure to to go on site and be in right. and go in to show up in the trailer and things like that. And uh, you know I don't know it's it it doesn't seem abnormal when I go to the meetings or go to That's you know good. but uh, yeah. So but it's really um, it depends on really having a very, uh, a, a life that's very prescribed, you know, with 
threading the needle to get where you need to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I heard your talk at the Chicago Humanities Festival, and you made a nice reference to a future built with bits and sticks. Yeah. And I'd love you to talk a little bit about that. And we're especially interested in tools at Cooper Hewitt, and I mm. wondered, can you, mm. can you talk about some of the new tools that you're using yeah. for your projects? Yeah, sure. I think, I mean, this whole age has been about what to do with information, you know, and people have done different things with the tools. So, you know, everyone can, figure out so much more with digital tools and creating different versions, versions and forms. But I think mainly what we've done with the tools, the, the biggest thing has been to use the information as data. And, and um, um, so finding out uh, one thing that we have been doing over the last five years is, is um, working with companies to, when we're working for Ser visitor serving organizations like the Cooper Hewitt, for example, we, we've done a lot of um, big data analysis on different design ideas in real time. So to see before you spend all this money on building a new uh, museum, you can tell if the ideas are gonna be successful mm. with the mass market. So that's one really, I think, just not everyday use of, of um, information as well, you know, we're very, I like the analog tools as well as the digital tools, and you know, and it's the combination of all of those things that, um, it, in the end, it's not about the tool, but you have to know which tool to pick up, mm -hmm. to depending on what the design, where the design is going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, I came a little bit late. I should first <laughs> apologize for oh, that. Oh no, actually. worries. Uh, I can happily report that all of the museum is under construction. <laughs> <laughs> um, but all good. Um, I thought it was interesting because I saw the second half of the presentation and you speak about parameters around islands, and then you speak about uh, cities without walls and breaking down boundaries. And I thought, oh wow, that's so poetic, all of it. Um, but it's all about basically edges and, mm -hmm. and the, the systems that we create around these edges and, and basically yeah. the wall or the boundary. And what could we learn from that if we look at a larger city like Chicago or New mm. York for that matter? Mm -hmm. What would you like to break down in, in each of those cases? Mm. I, I'm, I'm really interested in, in the breaking down be of the systems between wild systems and urban people systems. I mean, with some of the testing we've been doing in Chicago, like. and I think you've been interested in it mm -hmm. too with those wild places, that you, mm -hmm. the getaway places. Um, how do you weave those into an urban setting right. and how close can you make that contact so that you do have that reprieve mm -hmm. um, from the intensity of the urban um, condition? Um, in a way, it's making it more dense just with other species as well. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's equally as important to do tall buildings as to do some of these um, urban infrastructure projects that are doubling as natural escapes. Mm. Uh, what is an escape for you? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I knew you were gonna ask. <laughs> um, I'm doing research simultaneously. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. I think um, it's like a mental escape and, um, and that means surrounding yourself with something different than what you're used to. So um, if you're working all day in an office, you know, it's, um, it's great to one of the things I do is go out um, really early in the morning, once a month, right. on uh, the lakefront and do mm. a, a bird watching. Ah. But, yeah, I oh. mean, I'm not an expert or anything, but I go with a group, the Audubon group, and yeah. and that's an amazing escape because you people know everything about these birds, and, and I'm really the novice, and I just you know it's it's great to do something like that. Oh, she so started out. I like that. It's yeah. really great. <laughs> You're a wannabe ornithologist, I think. Yeah. You, you talk <laughs> about birds a lot. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I do. Um, I, they're they're so interesting because they're everywhere, but we don't really you don't notice them until you notice them, and then you see them. You see how much variety there. I think anything that has a lot of variety is really interesting mm -hmm. to me. We have a lot of students in the audience, and I know they would love to hear about how you got to where you are today. Yeah. So if you can talk a little bit about your background, that would be great. Okay. Um, yeah, the, the 
I mean, I had a pretty um, um, maybe typical architecture education, but I think I started out really looking at either maybe engineering and and then I found architecture and totally fell in love with it. Um, I, I traveled to Europe for one year in my undergrad and, and then, you know, just seeing all the, the, the how close the architecture is tied to culture and um, how it really defines what you think about a culture that really made me excited about that studying it further. Um, and so, you know, I went on to um, study urban urbanism and had a, like a rotary fellowship and I decided to go to to like a central place in Europe, Switzerland, and and and, um, and at the ETH, and I spent time there, um, and then went on to the GSD to study for my masters. But I think one one of the most important things as a student that I did was really have a um, a true thesis project. And I know thesis thesis programs go in and out of favor, you know, w w at various institutions, but. For me, what it did was really allowed me to define some of the questions that I continue and uh, that I continue to work on now, um, as opposed to um, project after project. Um, I really started to zo zoom in on what I thought was interesting, a continuous prob problem, um, and it had to do with how we define nature and how culture and nature are commingled. Um, and so that continues to be kind of a basis for me to, to look at problems in interesting ways. So, so after I finished, I just went on to work for someone that I really respected. I think that was important because we all, you know, as architects have to um, do an internship and, and, and work for someone. Um, and so f going to a place where you really want to be and learn something um, is is important. I went to Rotterdam and worked with Rem. Um, I mean, there were probably three on my list, and I just got the first job there, so I stayed. Yeah, what's with the other two? <laughs> what? What's with the other two? Oh, well, I'm not gonna. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, it's um, you know, it, it's somewhat random, I guess, your experience <laughs> about how you end up what you do. But um, but what I got out of that was. Uh, really just a, an amazing experience working on, luckily, a couple projects that were actually built, which I understand that it's, you know, sometimes you can get put on a project and it might be competition and you, you might get stuck on that competition, 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 but I luckily got to satisfy my urge to build and, mm. and then um, I got the bug for that and just, you know, wanted to continue doing that. So yeah. <laughs> you, you say um, th you talk about the definition of nature mm. and how this was already at the beginning part of your career while you were studying, and then if you look back at at that point, what is the difference in the definition? Because it must have changed, like for you, but also for mm. all of us over those years. Mm -hmm. I'm curious how you looked at it then and now. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. For my thesis, I really was looking at water, and um, I was my thesis was like a park that cleaned river water. Huh. So it was um, through aeration and various ways. So it wasn't that different than than the way that right. I look at it now. You clean the water and it was used for, you know, uses like urban uses um, and then put back into the river. So it was, a, it was basically an aeration station. Hmm. So it wasn't that different, but, it, but I think um, yeah, the blurring of the identity of what's natural and what is um, designed, I think, is really interesting still mm. because we're currently designing like a 90-acre piece of land that, that it was a former airport. Mm -hmm. And the, and, um, the um, pressure was, you know, we, we met with so many groups to understand how they would want to use it. Um, and we wanted to... In have these different um, kind of ecosystems there uh, that could be visitable, so mm -hmm. you know, very open to people. But we we're using a geometry that was somewhat more, um, you know, obviously designed like um, um, straight lines and hexagonal shapes for for the purpose of of um, zoning out this site. 
Um, and one of the critiques, because um, we had to be critiqued by the, a series, a council of landscape architects and uh -huh. architects, was to make it look more natural than it would. But you know, the thing is, it, um, it 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 will have all the components that will make it a successful habitat. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't necessarily have to be a replicating swoopy lines and curves. Mm -hmm. That was so. That was that was an interesting rubbing up against that that. Um, difficult point of when you are actually designing nature for a city, you know, mm -hmm. how will it look? Remind me what the public components are in the park, because there is a visitor center, I think. And uh, yeah, yeah, there would be, um, well, it was this former airport, and then yeah. um, now it, it's, it's actually adjacent to a museum campus that has um, the Shedd Aquarium and the Field Museum, um, and the and and also um, what else is there? Well, it, we were basically trying to do outdoor versions of the museums, um, huh. and put like for the field they do they have a lot of collections of taxidermy birds mm -hmm. and things. So making a spot that you could actually see migrating birds land there um, with you know walkways and things like that. Um, and then there's a um, there's a visitor center. There's a kind of a reef. That people can explore, um, and the reef creates a new lagoon where they can do fish spawning and mm -hmm. and um, kind of supplementing what the shed, you know, has inside. And then the last thing is this big music concert hall outdoor that that has installations on it that are related to the stars. So it kind of relates to the Adler Planetarium, which is also there. So it's it's just like taking these ingredients and trying to make them ex external. Um. And this refers back to the sense of mysticism that you were talking to mm. um, with um, uh, space and, uh, and under the ocean. Yes, yeah. <laughs> indeed, yeah, it has both in that case. Nice. Speaking yeah. of the ocean and, uh, and waterways, you're uh, a real river fanatic and, and yes. water fanatic uh, dedicated to the waterways. Um, can you talk a little bit about your process, for mm. example, with the aquarium project? Mm. How do you gather your mm. team and talk about yeah. the problem at hand and the challenge and then attack it? Yeah, th this, was, this one is really interesting because I think it's, it's starting to, uh, the aquarium um, chose us to help them think strategically about their project. And it's not necessarily the building, which, so it's, it's really interesting. So I see the whole project as a, as a research piece that will then inform us you know, for years to come on various projects, but um, um, really involving our our office and going literally going to meetings with big teams. Um, we've done a kind of a science fair with with the National Aquarium staff. Yeah. They have like <coughs> they have 400 staff um, to kind of expose the process to them as well of the research, so they can understand wh where the project. It, what we're learning and they can be influencing it. It's really, I think that type of project and the landscape projects are very important to have that, to have a strong community uh, exchange, you know, whoever that community might be. Mm -hmm. So the process is one of um, doing a lot of work in our own space, sharing the work and, and going back. It's a kind of iterative, iterative process that will hopefully result in this plan at the, probably sometime this summer we'll be publishing our plan on how they will attack those different issues. And what's the schedule on that project? Well, I think... In principle. Uh, yeah, <laughs> in principle, it, it's a little bit like the rebuild f by design project in that there are, and we're both jurors on, the, on that um, inter interesting project, um, in that there are solutions at different scales, and they will be able to choose in, um, the hierarchy and the, the mm. timing of when they implement some of these things. Mm. But um, things like the dolphin question are pretty, you know, urgent in a certain way. And so, yeah, we will work with them to help them kind of prioritize what mm -hmm. they do first. Mm -hmm. Your so. question about timing is actually really interesting. I've been struggling with this um, thing with community work. Mm. 
in, in the design process, which I think yeah. is very important. But yeah, for almost every project, your community is also changing over time. Yeah. So you're speaking to a group of people that may not live there in 10, 15, 20 years. So how do you incorporate that in, yeah. in your process? Uh, that's, yeah. a, that's a really good point because oftentimes um, when you work with like in a charrette format mm -hmm. or something, um, people that have the loudest voices are the ones that get heard. Mm -hmm. And so um, it, it's really important to kind of try to, to find out who the constituents really are, even if they're not represented mm -hmm. somehow. So it is, it is a big challenge, you're right, it, it really is. Most of the time, the loudest constituents are the ones that are worried about parking spaces. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. So I know something about Jeannie that mm -hmm. I want to share with you, and, <laughs> and that is um, she has a very unique collection, and that is a collection of dirt, uh, <laughs> which really underscores her love for exploring different materials. And I find it really interesting that um, you bridge these scales from mm -hmm. materials to full-fledged mm -hmm. Cities. Can you yeah. talk a little bit about that and what you find so fulfilling about that scale of A to yeah. C? Yeah. Well, I think it's. I do think that architecture can be specific about a place, but you can pick. It doesn't mean that you're like replicating other architecture that was built there before, but you know, trying to find what something that is essential um, that you can uh, relate to, and you know, earth and dirt. It are like. The, the essence of uh, really a essence of a place and they are uh, all different colors and all different so I don't know I'm a very terrestrial and um, um, material driven person I think um, and I like to play with that scale um, we have a big shop also in our office where we make things and I, 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 even though it's possible to do so much digitally and we do it, you know I just don't feel like giving up that playground aspect and you know, I want to keep that going. So th most of the people that work together with me are similar and we, you know, like to make things. Um, and so I think when you do designs for installations and museums or recently we designed some objects for a dance company to use in, in one of their productions, you really get the, to have that um, fulfillment of making something that's, you know, full scale. Wonderful. Mm. She keeps them in little six ounce transparent cubes in her house, which <laughs> really made me laugh. <laughs> Good well, storage nice technique. Yeah. I mean, dirt is like also a free souvenir, you know, <laughs> in, in, unless <laughs> you get questioned by TSA. Right. What are you doing? Which, <laughs> It's actually quite special to go to your office. I have been doing many studio visits over the past 10 years, basically. And it's always interesting that as soon as you walk into an office, you basically get a sense of how the office works, uh, just by the layout of the office and the atmosphere that's in the office. And you have a very, well, you're a very friendly personality to begin with, but you also feel that in, in the office, it feels like a pleasant place to be in. And I wonder if, if you have a trick to mm. get it off of the atmosphere mm. going to the right, mm. uh, yeah. That's a good question it's because recently we've been growing and like that culture that you talk about is so important to our process and um, the, the openness that needs to be there so no one's hiding or c trying to control information mm -hmm. and things like that that can happen in organizations. Um, so one, one thing that we do is um, we eat together and we recreate together, I guess. And, mm -hmm. and one, one kind of more organized aspect of that is our summer camp. We ah, so it was <laughs> a real camp that you were talking There's about. There's a real yeah. camp, yeah. <laughs> so we, we go to camp every <laughs> year. <laughs> Not that, that was a different camp. Okay. But we go to our own camp and do camping, like, W there's a, a a camp that we go to mm -hmm. that has a lake and different lodgings, or you can you know pitch a tent, and we do various activities. It's just you know it's just a fun way to get to know people. Um, Good. You know, it's more personal, on the more personal side. The, re <laughs> the reason why I'm asking this is actually I was looking at one of your last slides, and it's a few people sitting at a table, I think, and there's some text over it that is referring to uh, one of the words is emotion. Mm. And I've been thinking about this quite a bit, um, and I wonder if we need to have a bigger role for emotion in, for instance, mm. how we think about cities and how we talk about cities, how we design cities. 
um, or mm. buildings for that matter. Because we're so, uh, f we've been quite focused on, for instance, data or mapping yeah. and uh, all of yes, the things yes. that you can very easily research. So that's why right. it's, all, and mm -hmm. it may also be interesting to tie that back to the community outreach piece, mm -hmm. the conversations with the communities. Perhaps you can yeah. say something about it. I, I think that's a, a really great idea because, I mean, it, we are designing places for people, mm -hmm. you know, people to use. And like w with uh, Reverse Effect, it was really illuminating was interviewing the users of, of the river, mm -hmm. I know, from, for so many different, re incredibly different reasons, mm -hmm. uh, different economic um, structures, different, different purposes, and but they all used it and loved it in their own way, which huh. was so interesting. I thought, um, and that helped us to. It just helped think about it and st and took it out of the map world for a minute to think about why yeah. we, people would yeah. use it. Um, when with with the um, with the dolphin issue and the, the this marine mammal rescue piece that we're working on with my students at Rice, um, we, we interviewed and people that were um, involved in marine mammal rescue teams. Mm -hmm. Most of them are volunteers and they get, you know, a call and there's huh. like a, you know, so like a manatee wound up in a piece of plastic or something or, you know, and they, they call up and they, they mobilize and they get together to do the rescue and, um, you know, suddenly we were talking about it and we realized that, you know, how emotional it must be to lose an animal after you did all that. It's right. great if it survives and it's a great story, but, mm -hmm. you know, that aspect of just putting all the effort into it and loss. Mm -hmm. And so that started to inform some of the students thinking about designing the space, like, for the people, the volunteers, like, huh. what would they do, you know, after they lost a, an animal. So, oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So I can see eager audience members, <laughs> but before one last question for the architecture students out there, I think they may appreciate. When are you stumped? Because in the New Yorker article about you from a couple of years ago, you said, the longer I delay on coming up with mm. the form, oh. the better. But what if you're yeah, delaying yeah. and delaying? What do you oh, do yeah. when you're stumped? Where do you find you your inspiration? Yes, that, that is so good. You can't delay forever. There's right. like a deadline. <laughs> right. um, but, you know, delaying long enough to, I think it's the opposite of school, because in school, you're encouraged to delay it somehow. Mm. I don't know. You feel like you can do it, but when you have a meeting and you got to show something, maybe it's similar to pinup, you got to mm -hmm. do something. So um, the time to turn off the research and just go make things, and right. that that's really... Um, you know, where, what the way that I do it is just go in the model shop and, you know, you, you just, you do have to be able to turn that piece off um, because there's, I don't know, for people who like to read, you can just keep digging and digging and digging endlessly. So there's a moment where all of that has to be turned off and just, I, from my technique, is just like to go make, physically make something. So you start making rather than taking the pencil out or going to the computer, you start making. Yeah, just go in the shop and, um, you know, start using the wire cutter or doing mm. something like that. Or, um, yeah, and then I like also very much to, the thing that's different than school is like working together with others, so like, you know, at the same time, like trying things out that are not necessarily successful, but you you can talk about what you're seeing and, and not, it's not a solitary activity for me. It's more, I like thinking out loud, you mm -hmm. know, thinking about the project out loud with others. And um, then you get the range of solutions and you kind of, you can see what's gonna work and what's not gonna work. How large is your team? Uh, well, we're about like 54 now, but you know, each particular team on a project would only be, you know, from right. maybe like from three to 10, 12. Right. Mm hmm So, yeah, it's, it's, the bigger it gets, the more there is to keep up with. <laughs> right, that's for sure. Yes, I see you. Oh, okay. Changing course, oh, yeah. thank you. <laughs> um, tell us about the impact of the MacArthur on your life mm. and your practice and oh. your thinking. Okay, good question. Yeah, though, it, it, I was totally shocked that I received that call and I have to tell you, I, I heard my assistant told me that it's um, the MacArthur Foundation on the phone, and they, they have a headquarters 
nearby and I thought oh they probably want us to redo their headquarters <laughs> <laughs> like, and then you know so it was really it was super shock but um, um, amazing and what I guess for me it just it validated for myself like what we're doing where which direction we're going and able to do it with more confidence and not not have to worry what other people are thinking about my practice because it is I feel like we're doing some things that are very similar to the group of architects, but we are doing some things that are, you know, slightly different, and it, and, um, it just made it okay to do that. It was affirmation. Yes, affirmation is good work. Oh, what did it do for my life? Yeah. Um, it, well, made me busier, <laughs> but, um, but um, let's see, I think, you know, not, not that much has, has changed, um, you know, personally. I'm just, I was able to, you know, take on a few projects that would, would not be bringing in, you know, money for the firm just because of that, that base there. But, but um, yeah, I think I just pretty much lived the same lifestyle, only just slightly amped up more, accelerated. <laughs> Thanks. Questions? Uh, Here's one. Yes. Um, you seem to use a lot of metaphor in your work. Hmm. Um, you know, with the shape of the boathouse informed by uh, mm -hmm. the motion of a person going, and mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. arts in the Civic Justice Center uh, informed by the different scale of mm -hmm. your uh, oh. Context. And I was wondering if that's a conscious part of your design process whereby you look for mm. these metaphors or if it's something that just kind of happens naturally? Um, that's a good question. I think mm, metaphor is a great way to communicate with people. I know like sometimes um, it's necessary to invoke it just to make someone understand what uh, what you're trying to do and it maybe it wasn't really like um, um, for example, if I explain the aqua tower to people, it really didn't come from replicating anything or trying to be like water. In fact, we didn't really even name the building. That was, um, um, if anything, it was more about strata than, than water a, at all. But um, sometimes it helps to say what things are like to, to help people get a better understanding. And I, I think can probably tell I really like to communicate design to public. I think it's so important and it helps advance the entire design conversation because the more public that is excited about design and, and sees design, well, you know this, I mean, it's this, you know, it's, all, it's better for all of us. You know, it's the only way forward really. So um, what I will use whatever it takes to make it understood. Um, um, so for the Arcus example you mentioned, really wasn't, that was more of a kind of, again, it was more of, a, of something that the school could rally around. We, you know, they knew that they were working at these different scales, so we used our building to um, help them describe that to others, you know? So yeah, it's kind of, there's different ways to use it. Um, we probably make use of all the different ways. That's a good question, though. When you speak about language, it's quite funny. I was thinking, hmm, this is so nice that we have a conversation about architecture and we have not heard the word agency once, <laughs> 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 which is a problem when you go to the schools because mm. it's very often mm. uh, overused the without, yeah. yeah. There are always buzzwords, you mm -hmm. know, that, that will live for a certain number of years and then go away, but like um, try to consciously not use them, but even though they're good, like that mm -hmm. one would, is a great word to, to use. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> um, but as much as possible, trying to make something understandable for, for all of us, not, not that you're dumbing down what you're saying, but just um, communicating in language. I mean, once one thing we do too internally is we have right we have writers working in staff mm -hmm. um, because I think you know a lot of times we architects are not the best writers after we come out of grad school just thinking about you know architecture and listening to these 
critique. So um, I think it's a super important part of mm -hmm. what we do. It's Hi, so, um, so I work for a real estate development firm that builds tall buildings. So when I'm looking at the Aqua Tower, I guess one of the biggest questions I have for you is what sort of um, maybe were some of the biggest negotiations mm -hmm. that were at that development table? You know, I'm with all of the undulating mm -hmm. uh, facades and the different locations of the windows, yeah. it seems like yeah. repetitious floor plates would Her. be quite a challenge. Um, yeah. And I know for developers today, yeah. anyway, you know, that's important. I don't know if right. this was one of the pre, one mm -hmm. of the boom buildings that maybe no. things were, were less but um, no, it was. I mean, it was serious constraints. Uh, I, I think it's one of the most constrained building types that there is. And um, um, as you know, if you're a developer, there's different um, things. One of, one of the biggest constraints is time. You know, so w with all the loans that and all the financing, I think there were 15 different um, banks up and lenders for this project. Um, and so these loans are, you know. You, you want to build as fast as possible. And so we were constrained by, with the different shapes of the floor plans, um, it, we couldn't add time to the project. So it was really forced us to be creative about how it would be built and work together with the builder and the developer from the very beginning, you know, having the build, builder in the room. And um, I know, because if you think about it, if you just add, you have an 82-story tower, if you add four hours, um, to each floor, because the floors were done in three-day pours. Mm -hmm. um, just adding like four hours on for, for layout or something can add months and months onto the schedule. So that these so time is one of the biggest constraints. And the negotiations were, you know, the way our developer Magellan worked was really getting multiple viewpoints in the room from the builder to the someone who represents the potential buyer someone who represents um, um, the ownership and and all of those voices would be brought in at once so it did it, you know i think on the base we probably went through you know 12 different designs on the on the very base because they were they couldn't change any longer the tower because they're already in the sales um, Part. So it really everything was happening down at the base to try to make it, you know, come in. So lots of things. Yeah. Did the 82 floors come from the developer as the request, or did you come up with that? Um, well, number? we yeah, the the original plan had a shorter squatter ta tower there, and um, here's another interesting thing about towers: you really don't decide how tall they are. <laughs> I mean, they're constantly changing until the very last minute. Um, and all, so the, the tower is like a spreadsheet, you know, with <laughs> with different sections in the Excel spreadsheet that represent, you know, how many floors have a nine foot five, nine foot six ceiling, how many floors have ten feet, and so on. And it's just constantly like adjusting until it's built. You know, it's really or even like the number of rental apartments versus condos, there were more people that wanted to buy, so we had to like shift that line down. And um, yeah, it's it's the most it, it's shocking really because they're the biggest buildings and they are being designed to the last minute, <laughs> really just with flux built in. So you really don't ever. I don't think you decide how tall a building is unless you're going for the super tall and you're trying to break a record mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, you have to be just flexible and ready for it to be adjusted to market. With it's, that Chicago wind, also. It, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. You did a nice uh, book with. Um, which was related to the exhibition that you did in, uh, yes. in Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, so the book was with Zoe Ryan, and there's this whole section in the book with endless, endless towers. <laughs> was this before the, the, the Aqua Tower, or it was this leading up to that? No, oh, for, f um, versions of Aqua, uh, uh, no, or, or after? Were I yeah, think no. there were little models of, uh, I think there were different yes, towers, yes, weren't there? Yes, yes, yeah. I showed that tonight. Oh, right I, before I, you I didn't got, see that But yet. no, it, it, all of them yeah. kind of go back to the, um, the ancestor of Aqua, uh -huh. <laughs> and they, they, so different, we, we kind of put it into different, there's only certain ideas you can work on with towers, and one of them was 
we called exospatial, so buildings that use the exterior to be a spatial element. Um, um, different sol solar carving is mm -hmm. another one, so they, they really came out of that first initial idea, but we've been exploring them in different ways. That was what you were working on for here, I think. Yes, it was. It Did is. Did you show that too? It or? I didn't show it. Can no, we talk about it? Well, it's still got to be, it's got one more, so hopefully only one more city yeah. review mm -hmm. meeting. Um, so it's not been approved yet. And one, one of the things that's difficult with it is that it, it's arguing for, um, you know, breaking the, the, the zoning setback. Um, and so for a good reason, you know, in order to preserve light for mm -hmm. the High Line. So, but it's been a struggle. So I, I, I can tell you that, you know, if you want to break the zoning envelope, it, it is a struggle. You do have to prove it, you know, a, you really have to prove it. So mm -hmm. we're still in the proving it out phase and, you know, fingers crossed it goes forward. I think many New Yorkers would be very excited yes. to see it. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. yeah, it's not dead yet. This was mentioned sort of to the side um, during the talking about the Aqua Tower, but wasn't really discussed. Um, how does being a high profile woman in architecture affect your work or does it affect your work? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, um, it, I don't think it affects the work. I mean, the, the uh, well, maybe, no, I, I, I honestly, I don't know. It's hard to say. It's just the work is the work, and in, in it's guided by me, but, you know, it's part, it's, it's a collaborative process with a lot of people involved. Um, I think the place where I feel the most odd is when I'm in the tall building situation because a lot of the conferences, like I'm, a, um, I'm actually chairing the jury for the Council on Tall Buildings and Urban Habitat. You know that group, CTBUH, <laughs> um, with the with the great acronym. Um, <laughs> um, it, but they, but when I'm on those kinds of things, I do kind of sense like, oh, I'm the only one here, mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, so it is kind of a rarefied um, world that does the tall buildings. Um, I think it'll hopefully change. So you talk about these teams that you, you like to collaborate with yeah. the community, with the contractor, you bring them in early. Um, the question becomes, with all of this consensus building, and, and you even do all of this research, so you have all of these different things coming together, where does, you, and earlier you mentioned something about will or imposing your will, and that mm -hmm. you didn't really impose your will, but you have some dynamic kind mm -hmm. of projects. Where, where does your will fit in? in mm -hmm. More importantly, like, where's the conflict resolution? How do you personally yeah. manage conflict resolution? Oh. What's your field? <laughs> <laughs> Are you a lawyer? <laughs> I, I won't say. I'll, I want to know. I'm an architect, by the way. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I like that. No, um, no. The, of course, there's will and there's ego. Also, I would never deny that. But you know, it's it's like the way that you get there, and by sorting, by looking at a lot of solutions just on the process side internally, um, you know, it, it makes it possible to see what's working and what isn't. So you, you, I get to decide, I guess you could say in that sense. Um, um, but f for, but before even starting that, you know, there's no harm in listening to what people have to say. And in fact, in order to do that, you have to actually believe that they might have something interesting or valuable to say. And if you don't believe that and you just think that it's, you know, a waste of time or, you know, just going through the motions, then it's a pain. But, you know, if you, there could be a spark, you know, somebody could tell you something that is fascinating or could set your mind in a different direction. And so you just, you know, you have to have a positive attitude about it, I guess. And um, there, there are conflicts, especially with public projects um, and especially big public projects like mm -hmm. parks are like incredibly hard um, and landscape architects do it much better I think than architects um, but I'm trying to learn from them some techniques <laughs> just really listening uh, finding ways to let people speak 
their mind or to register their ideas is helpful, definitely helpful. Um, in the end, those kind of conflicts that occur, I, I mean, like for the Northerly Island project, for example, um, we were told, the city told us that there were like three bankers boxes of plans that had been done by both individuals and different firms um, for that piece of land because everybody saw that land and they were like, oh, I want to put my museum to maritime history on there. And you know, there were so many different desires that wanted to be mapped across this piece of land. So we, we really did look, we looked at all of them and then we just started doing some meetings, stakeholder meetings and inviting different people. Um, and it, we did, we set up the one that, this one is really sticks in my mind because we, we basically formed four teams and with different members of the community on the teams with each one had a designer on a team. So the designer actually drew what they were talking about mm -hmm. and then we, um, we put up the four solutions. We kind of worked them up so they would all be viable and interesting because you have to be ready to go with any one of them, you know, not your favorite. And um, and the, then we, you know, this, this, I guess at the, the end of the day, the uh, people voted on it and then the city decided. But yeah, you have to be kind of open to having not your favorite be chosen. Actually, my favorite wasn't chosen. The favorite one was um, kind of using the land to spell out Chicago. Mm -hmm. on that <laughs> <laughs> Which would be amazing if you fly yeah. in. That's, uh, yeah. And then the I, the dotting the I would be the island, you know. Oh. So, but the, it wasn't picked. <laughs> is it help? Is that, was that answering your question, kind of? Yeah, or, okay. yeah it definitely does. Thank okay. You. Other questions? I have another one. We sat down uh, a few weeks ago in your office, and what I saw tonight was interesting because you speak a lot about the joy of building, and it's really making you tick. Yeah. But also when we sat down, suddenly something started to twinkle in your eyes when the word research came up. And I was like, <laughs> literally, that happened. And I was like, ah, oh, this is uh, great, yeah. because you, you like doing yeah. research. Um, yeah. But I also wondered, like, how is the research that you do in your office, how do you try and make the difference from the research that um, a university could be doing mm. uh, or an acad mm. yeah, another academic yes. institution? Oh, that's, uh, that is such a good question, because I think there's amazing research going on. In different institutions mm -hmm. in architecture and urban design. Um, the difference maybe is just like the chance to apply it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and also, we're building up our body of research and uh, that lives within the inst our own institution, you know, and, and, um, and we've been trying to, we're trying to learn from universities how they do it, but how do you keep that knowledge accessible to new people coming in and how does it, you know, how do you maintain your, your knowledge within your own office? But I think the most exciting thing is when you're able to deploy it, you know, in huh. s s and, and tie it back to like the reverse effect and bringing that into the work on the boathouse and, and things like that. just being able to, to connect those two dots with a physical project that's built and, and a project that's living on, on paper. The continuity in the research is interesting if you think about the office because usually turn, uh, turnaround in offices is very high. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure about in yours. I can imagine it's actually n not, not that high because no. it's a pleasant place. But yeah, say that on average an architect is there between two and four years. Oh, ours yeah. is much higher, I think. See, I good. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's also, you know, you have to live through a Chicago winter, so you, you get, like, <laughs> the diehard people that know how to, they, they're, they, they can do it and they stay there. But, um, no, I think it's, it's partly, though, honestly, it has to do with the fact that if you're in New York, there's so many interesting places you can work. I mm -hmm. mean, and so you maybe want to go around and try different, different places. Mm -hmm. and, and Chicago's architecture community, though strong, is smaller, much smaller. Mm. Um, so there's just not as, you know, it's not as easy to go walk out of one door and go into another one. Mm -hmm. um, plus, I think there is a, there's a bonding and there's like a feeling of um, kind of working on something together and producing mm -hmm. it together that uh, that is strong there. So. Good. <laughs> I bet, I bet. 
Okay. Okay. You mentioned how much you love to build in your city. Um, I just wonder, do you think about opening practices in other cities or worldwide? What do you think mm -hmm. about that? Yes, good question. Uh, no, it's definitely um, whether to probably more often we will be having like beachheads and you know different places for different projects and um, so yeah we've thought about how how to do that um, and I think it would always probably need some people from the the core office to be um, maintaining that culture you know in a new office um, so it's it's definitely on our minds right now so it, it, it probably is something that will eventually happen. Good, we'll welcome you here. <laughs> okay. 60% <laughs> more space at Cooper Hewitt means that we finally have the opportunity to show off our collection of 217,000 objects. And part of that will be showcasing new acquisitions. So you can be sure that the Jeannie Gang drawings and model will be part of that. <laughs> so you can see Jeannie's work soon um, at the Cooper Hewitt, and we look forward to welcoming you there. So thank you very, very much. Um, Jeannie, this has Thanks. been a marvelous discussion. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having me. <laughs>